Lumio. So I'm telling a story from the beginning, but I wasn't part from the beginning. I came in as now coming out of beta, just to be clear about that. Um, Lumio is a worker-owned co-op, so they were very clear when they formed it to be a worker-owned co-op. Uh, but it, legally, it's a um, LLC, and it's based in New Zealand. So it's the first ever LLC worker-owned co-op in New Zealand. So one of the themes for us has been innovating, and when we talk to advisors... Score privilege one over the other as the core question, but rather what makes the most impact. And in fact, after the, the break, we will have some of both. So we will see how that plays. Instead of 15 minutes, we will do 10 minutes break, if you don't mind. Uh, All right, I think I'm going to talk first. Uh, ah, there we go. All right. Are you on Lumio? Like, do you have an account? I don't do I <laughs> do have one. I hardly use it, but I do have one. <laughs> Yay. All right. So uh, I think I'll leave that. And if there's a strong need at the end, you just say so. And I could take one minute and just go on my account and show you a few things. OK. There's 100% of every advisor we've ever talked to says we try to innovate in too many ways. Um, so, you know, worker own co op based in New Zealand, open source software. So, the founding story is that um, a bunch of people participated in Occupy in Wellington. Um, several of them were really taken by the process um, of figuring out daily decisions and using um, the consent process of yes, no, abstain, um, and you know, decline. And uh, for some of them, it was a new experience, and it, it was very powerful, both in what worked well and what didn't work. A couple were technologists. Uh, ben, who many of you have met, came from collective intelligence. Some were designers. Several were activists. So a bunch of them came together and thought, most people won't ever come to a, a place, so there must be a tool online that's sort of capturing this process. And at the time, and Spiral was sort of early stage forming. It's a hub in Wellington that was started by a programmer to sort of do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, stuff. The tagline is more people doing stuff that matters. And so they went to Inspiral and said, we have this idea, sort of thinking, for you. And uh, they said, we love the idea. We love the idea of having tools that help get peer-to-peer -peer work done. So we're happy to be your first customer. We're happy to help you. You can base yourself here, but you guys have to do it. So that was the founding of Lumio. Um, from the um, beginning, I think, because they, they appreciated having lots of different types of people um, and talent coming into the fold. And in terms of the who, it was a workaround co-op, but lot, there was always a big circle around them of contributors, volunteers, sort of people um, stepping into the circle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we were at about five years now. So um, I'd say this was uh, 2012 was the bulk of the forming. Um, so the original notion was people having a voice um, in decisions that affect them. And so I know inclusion was one of the questions. I think fundamentally Lumio was about inclusion. Um, and there, some of the core principles was that people will work through agreement when they're in relationships. So it was a small group architecture. That was always the core principle. And to move from divergence to through dialogue convergence, dialogue in writing on this platform. There was also a belief in transparency, that transparency would lead to better decisions and increased accountability. And I'd say coming out of Arab Spring and Occupy, um, there was a core belief that there was a need for tools that move people um, from talk to agreement for action. So there was always a bias towards action with Lumio. Um, so, so from the funding growth perspective for five years, um, from the beginning it was bootstrapped. And New Zealand is definitely a different context where you can sort of get away with 
doing a lot with very little, I'd say. So there was friends and family, two, two early stage supports. One was a, a small crowdfund to get started from volunteering completely to a little bit of, of funding. And then there was a friends and family loan. So those were the early stages. Very early on, um, Wellington City Government wanted to use it for a policy engagement as a test. And they said, we don't really know how to do this in terms of the outreach and how to facilitate online. So they contracted Lumio to do that work. And early on, the light bulb went off that we can make some money um, by be, being in a consulting role. And also, it'll help us deeply get to know our customers. So from fairly early on, we've had some revenue from a consultation role. Um, about uh, two and a half years in, we, we realized that the we really needed to, to upgrade the product. Um, and we had a bias towards moving towards interoperability. So we did a crowdfund campaign to support that work. And I'd say from you know a tech startup perspective, it really slowed us down. So, you know, again, we were working very lean, um, and it took us, you know, a whole year or so to work on that. Um, that was about the same time that um, Podemos started, and so we'd been growing very slowly around the world, mostly by activists, and all of a sudden we st started seeing, you know, dozens and then hundreds of groups in Spain um, uh, starting to form because the technologists that were part of the Podemos movement had identified Lumio as the sort of grassroots tool. So by this point, we were probably in about 50 countries, um, and it's always been very horizontal, organic growth. Early on, we saw that um, it was designed for activism, that people were liking the tool, they were just taking it to work. So early on, we saw the opportunity to monetize it in the workplace and really different kinds of workplaces. So from, uh, I'll, I'm gonna go back to the investment and I'll get back to users in a minute. Um, after that crowdfund, um, we, um, I, I wanted to say we've always gotten a little bit of philanthropic funding. Um, foundations mostly in the US, but a little bit globally as well, came to us and primarily with projects. And then we would get a, a um, third party to, to put the money through, but it's always, we've always been questioning, should we be a nonprofit? Should we have also a nonprofit? So we've been having, I'd say, a three-year question about what's the right structure for us. Um, and we decided we really needed to get a, a bigger round of investment. Always in the US, people, 100% of people said we had to move to the US um, and, uh, and, and, you know, not be a co-op. So we've got, and, um, so we ended up, we just were so confused. We didn't have the expertise, to be honest. So we just decided we can't afford to figure out coming to the US. We stayed in New Zealand and we ended up figuring out a redeemable preference share. So it was just trying, it was totally <coughs> fudging, trying to work it out. And then we ended up totally lucking out. We got a lead uh, investor from South Korea and we raised about $480,000 at the end of 2015. And we had that money was our intention to validate our business model. Um, some of the core questions I'd say the last couple of years as we've been moving towards that attempt to validate the business model have been US based or not US based, um, nonprofit or for profit or some combination. And from an investment stand, equity or something different. We've always had an inclination towards something different. And we always get the feedback we're trying to innovate in too many ways. In terms of our uh, users, they've always been horizontal. Um, uh, we think of our core user as entrepreneurs, the people in all different backgrounds, activists, NGOs, collective partnerships, small businesses, certainly a lot of co-ops, uh, government much more than we ever imagined at all levels, including like major initiatives nationally in New Zealand. Um, and families use it for elder care and where to go on vacation. Mm. Um, we spent 2016 trying to validate the business model and we learned mostly what wasn't working. Um, and we've right now been hovering at about 100 paid users. Um, the team for the last couple of years has been about 12. 
Um, we've always had a circle of contributors, and I'd say partners all over the world, like you guys, have been instrumental to our success. Um, we've focused a lot on being a different kind of organization, so we're a flat structure. We've never had a CEO. Um, we have self-managed teams. They're highly adaptive. Um, and we, we've open sourced that work as well at lumio.coop. Um, today, in, in the end of December for this year, we decided with the resistance movements all over the world, we would put a team on to um, travel and focus on that. So some of you were here. Um, Rich and Nanti have been in the U.S. for about six weeks and will be heading to Europe soon. They're sort of putting the focus on the resistance piece. But we decided that fundamentally, um, our product wasn't good enough. We were getting a lot of feedback um, from users, and so um, our runway is dwindling, and we're using the limited resources to add a bundle of new features and a major focus on interoperability so that the um, people can find Lumio where they're at, on Slack, on Facebook, wherever they are. Um, we're at a, a point where we've cut the team in half. Um, I'd say we're close to survival, like questioning about our survival. Um, we really believe in low, slow growth, so we're trying to figure out what will it take um, to see if these new features are enough to get a user uptick, to get a bigger influx of investment. We still really believe that we're onto something exciting, um, but we just we need to figure out how to stay alive at this point. So, <clears throat> any question? Quick question. Question. I, don't I don't know the term redeemable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's an instrument we have in the U.S., but not used terribly widely, that it, it actually <laughs> feels like a loan, but it, um, but it doesn't show in the books like a loan. So the investors have um, uh, pretty limited rights, to be honest, in the terms in our particular <laughs> case, where that no one is on the board. Um, in five years, um, there, they, there's a, a threshold to get a return only if we have the funds to pay them. We put in a provision if we were making a bunch of money that at 10 years we would raise that rate. But basically, it's a, it's a um, instrument that's highly favorable to the venture. And that was the case with the South Korean investor. We had a lead South Korean investor, and we had investors from the U.S., Canada, New Zealand. Uh, but 350,000 of it was from a lead investor in South Korea. Was, was this distinct from the crowdfunding round that you mentioned? Yeah, so we raised, I think it was about 250, if I'm recalling, from the, from the second crowd fund. And was that, were those donations? Or those those were donations. I will say I didn't mention, um, we, we have some, had also some yeah. angel funding along the way. Just, you know, uh, donate people giving us money without any expectation for us to do anything except good work. Did you send it to my email? Does Slack integration go public? Yeah. Is that public? Any day. Like, we're, we're in testing mode if anyone wants to be part of the testing. We're really close uh, to releasing it. What? That feels like the big ah, um, potential yeah, 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 follow up moment for you guys. Yeah. yeah. Or, no, I, I need uh, uh, summer yeah. 2004 so, uh, summer 2004 right, that's at Gmail. That, that was our gamble anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, so again, my name is my name is Griff, and uh, I'm the learning lead at Peer to Peer University, and happy to be here. Uh, for me, uh, my interest is that for folks who are interested in the pursuit of learning, I don't really see an alternative to the sorts of models that we're talking about. Um, I'm continu continually driven by a quote from Ivan Illich already 45 years ago that technology is available to develop either independence in learning or bureaucracy in teaching. And much of what I've seen in education technology online in the last decade leans much more towards bureaucracy in teaching than it does towards independence in learning. Uh, our organization really emerged out of open educational resources, which was a term that was coined in 2002, directly coming out of open source software initiatives. Uh, for five years, I think this, people were sort of figuring out what does it mean? What does it mean now that Creative Commons exists to think about that in the context of education? In 2007, um, many of our board members, uh, who were not our board members at the time because the organization did not exist, uh, were vital in drafting the Open Education Declaration, which started to think about openness in education, not just in terms of licensing, but also in terms of pedagogy <coughs> and public funding and you know the, the rest of it. Uh, PDPU emerged as a grassroots project out of this, uh, this conference and was incorporated as a 501c3 two years later in 2011. PDPU's work has always been focused on peer learning online and really developing open source tools, supporting learning communities that are aligned with values of collaborative work, peer learning, a community. Um, and I would say that, you know, in 2012 and 13, a, a question came up of, you know, what do we do now that these huge multi-million dollar funded projects have, you know, they've sort of taken the language of openness, they've taken the currency of online learning, and they've, they've sort of put this back into a hierarchical structure. Many of the, you know, the massive open <coughs> online course providers um, who sort of were viewed as our competition at the time were doing that, and we were a four-person nonprofit organization. So there was a question as to what's the role of an organization like P2PU in this. We had thousands of volunteers, people were developing courses, you know, you could sign up to t take a course or build a course, and that was very much the vibe of the organization. I joined in early 2015 uh, explicitly to start a new project, which has now become the fundamental work that we do. It's, uh, we call it learning circles, and these are basically study groups for people who want to take online courses together. And so rather than developing new open educational resources, we're focused on partnering with public libraries, community centers, adult education centers, universities around the world to help disseminate online learning um, to, to wider audiences. Um, just to give a sense of what Learning Circles looks like right at this moment, um, uh, uh, well, anyway, the screen's a bit narrow, but you can see that in, in, um, you know, in Chicago, Illinois, there's a group that's meeting for seven weeks working through a fiction writing online course together. Um, in, in Detroit, there's folks working through a Social Entrepreneurship 101 course. And these are all facilitated by librarians, by volunteers. We do some training up front. Um, but one thing that I can say out of, out of the work that started um, with Chicago is that not only are retention rates for online courses in learning circles more than 50%, but about 65% of the people we work with are first-time online learners. So this is not a normal community of, of people who are going online and thinking about how they can remix educational tools for, you know, for their own learning. So that's you know, something that I'm very proud of. Um, can you just compare, compare that to uh, rates across the, the space? Because I know that 50% completion is... Like night and day. Yeah, can you, I'm just trying to go to the next slide, but it, oh, since I'm you're sorry. zoomed in, I can't. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so as, as an organization, uh, as I said, we're a 501c3, we're a distributed organization. There are currently like three and a half of us. Uh, we have an eight-person board of directors uh, around the world. Uh, we have an executive director only in writing. We, are, we have traditional nonprofit bylaws, but for four years we've been trying you know, open governance, which I think we go back and forth on whether that's the term we want to use since open doesn't really mean anything, or it means, I mean, it just means whatever you want it to mean. Um, but essentially what that means is that the team is in charge of, you know, not only all strategic direction, you know, in between board meetings, but also running governance issues from uh, HR to, um, you know, 
bringing on new service providers, you know, so everything. So on a weekly basis, we have a team check-in call that's open to anybody. Uh, we have a work in progress call, a governance call, and then we have community calls on a monthly basis with, you know, learners, facilitators. Uh, and we have a subcommittee of our most active board members who helps us set salaries, do things like this, that things that an executive director would normally do. Uh, all of our governance guidelines from travel to the board bylaws are online, so you can look at those or I can share them later. And everything that we do is openly licensed. So in the last two years, uh, we have been a 100% grant funded organization before I joined and that had, I think, burned us a little bit a few times. And so there was a focus on developing learning circles in a way that would not just be a grant funded project, but could actually really turn into a viable business that was aligned with our values. Uh, and in the last two years, you can see that we've grown from working with one librarian in Chicago to now working with about 40 different cities with 12 organizers who are people who have full-time jobs as directors of learning and advancement at libraries or they're ed tech professors at universities, but people who are really advocating for our work in their neighborhoods. Uh, we've worked with almost 180 facilitators using 70 different online courses, most of which P2P has not built. Um, We've reached over about 1,200 people now. And in addition, we've seen the emergence of an online community of about 75 people who are now actively involved in not just how do I facilitate a better learning circle, but how does P2PU as an organization work better for me? And just last month, a woman uh, published her dissertation about our work after we had given her access to everything that we did, and she moved to Chicago for two months. And we've done this all with a smaller staff than we had when we were grant funded. Um, so thinking back, I was thinking last night about what what, what allowed this project to grow, uh, I think, quite successfully in the last two years. Um, I think starting with a community that needed this and really working closely offline with Chicago Public Library and if they were, if the librarians were going to be our initial set of stakeholders, making sure that this was designed with them, uh, always viewing volunteer-based facilitation. So, um, you know, keeping us honest along the way about if people don't want to opt into running a learning circle, we need to know that. Um, it's a bit of a little cliche, but you know, always thinking about technology as a tool and never a solution. Um, prototyping things offline for a number of months before we decide to commit anything to code. Uh, inviting participation at all levels is something that I think is vital in education, of giving learners the opportunity to feel like they can facilitate, they can develop a course. Uh, in Detroit, we had two women who came in to take an entrepreneurship course, and they're now facilitating that in their library. We have people in Kansas City who took an intro to web design course who are now contributing to an open course. And so folks who, you know, I think just when you say you need to care about openness, you need to care about CC, you need to care about these things, like, they don't. Um, but if you, you know, if you can create an environment where people benefit from that, I think we see a lot of folks really opting into that. I think, you know, we view our role as, you know, carrying a flag that is going to resonate with practitioners, but like I was just saying, recognizing that not everybody who benefits from our work needs to know who we are. Um, yeah, and as I said, like, this project began as a way to better deliver MOOCs, and I think it's really morphed into a way of empowering patrons and librarians to be better designing their programs and to do things for adults that um, are often relegated to K-12 through or just put online and assume that people can just find it if they want it. Uh, about a year and a half ago when the learning circles were starting, uh, the Ashoka Foundation invited us into their globalizer process, which was to put out like a three-year strategy of growth. Uh, and what we identified was strategic partnerships, targeted consulting, and leading to the open learning revolution. As I said, we were totally grant funded before, but now uh, this year and last year, about 25% of our revenues come from consulting with the goal of about 40% last year. 40% uh, next year, rather. And then finally, I thought I would just sort of throw out a few questions or ideas or, or tensions that I've been having um, for discussion later. So with regards to the partnerships, so right now, 33% of our revenue is going to non-team members. And so this is money that's passing through us to support, you know, give stipends for libraries or to pay evaluators or to, you know, to grow programs. And I think there's a huge missed opportunity as we think of, you know, as we're trying to fit in these distinctions of team, non-team, employee, contractor, project team member, like, it, I feel like we lack the language sometimes to actually really maximize the audience. And it's weird, especially when we're working with public institutions that have very set views of, of hierarchy and, you know, I can only wear my one hat at a time. It, it's a little tricky to sometimes feel like we can build a movement um, that, can, that can sort of blend across institutions, but that's what we're trying to do. 
Uh, the consulting, um, all of our consulting work is geared to minimize people's dependency on P2PU, not maximize their dependency. So we're running facilitator training workshops. We're <coughs> helping folks develop online courses to fill gaps that they've identified. Uh, we're you know, doing custom feature implementation. Um, but there is a bit of a curse of a service provider, which is that the more that the more that we act like a service provider, the more that people think we're a service provider. And I think with that can come a language of saying, well, we're doing this for P2P or P2P is doing this for us rather than, you know, we're trying to grow a program that works um, together. And then just sort of finally with the sort of revolution of what we want, like we do not want to be a huge organization. All of our partnerships are now being essentially spun off, whereas we train folks in, we're training folks in with the Kenya National Library Service right now, and it's not just to make them facilitators, it's to make them advocates so that they can be the ones doing the trainings in Tanzania and Uganda uh, down the road. Um, but then alongside of that, we need to think, okay, if all these programs are working well without P2PU, what's our role? And I think the thing that we've been thinking a lot about recently is first, um, you know, what are people used to paying for that we might replace? And so at libraries, you know, paying for access to closed content is a huge thing that libraries are paying tens of thousands of dollars of. And I think in the medium term, there's a maybe a transition away from paying to content to using OER and paying to support more engaging, equitable learning experiences. Uh, and then secondly, I think a lot of the platforms that we're discussing today you get involved in some sort of language of what it, what it is to be a public good. And I imagine the work that P2P does potentially being funded on a municipal level going forward. So stop there. I have a, I have a question on you know, the, it would be great if um, you could break down um, the flow of funds to people um, and compare the, what they receive compared to kind of living wages standards. Um, because a lot of the three presentations we've seen, one of the anxieties that I have about this platform movement is, can you live off it? Can your society live off, live off it? And the revenue streams are allocated to resources. Can you kind of dissect how that happens? How that does that compare to um, you know the next best job? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer that now? Um, yeah. So when I made the distinction between team and non-team. My anxiety is that as a team, we have an open salary model where everyone knows each other's salary. We have a form, we have a basically a spreadsheet that we update each year, uh, and we feel we all feel good about that. But again, that's only for team members. And so when we work on a project with Detroit Public Library or the Kenya National Library Service or a university in, in Paris, um, it's still up to them how they want to spend that money. And if we're not making somebody a team member and saying you're a full-time employee of P2PU, there's some level of you know we don't have that we don't have as much control over where that goes um, and this is a I think this is the sort of question that I'm asking is like when we engage in partnerships um, like right now we found folks who are aligned with our work and so the people who are facilitating 90 80 percent of them are full-time librarians or they're full-time educators and so they have full-time jobs wherever they live and P2PU is just a mechanism for them to do the work that they want to be doing. Uh, if we do have some volunteer facilitators and we have folks who find our tools online and start facilitating, we don't pay, I mean, we don't pay anyone anything for that. And so it's really only through partnerships that we start seeing that sort of clash. Um, but I, but the, like we have three projects right now in Chicago, Nairobi, and Paris where we have organizers who have a full-time job at a library or a university um, but P2PU is a big part of their identity as an employee, and I think it's a very much an open question is what do we offer those people in the long run? How do we think about our team in a way that's more than just the three and a half people who get a P2PU paycheck each month? Um, and I think that's a bit of an open question. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. In some sense, the question is P2PU is basically a peer production project mm -hmm. with a core support team that is like the Wikimedia Foundation to Wikipedia. But thinking of P2PU as a platform co-op, as opposed to a peer production enterprise with a small group uh, uh, inside that's trying to find ways to sustain itself, maybe. I'm just not sure whether the scaling, collaborative, interesting side of P2PU is the way in which the three and a half people manage the, to keep body and soul together uh, as opposed to how you actually create 
open learning circles and an educational system on a peer production model that's purely, that's basically voluntary and, and, and uh, um, social. Which is fine and fascinating and interesting, but it's, it's uh, the, the challenges you raise don't seem to be of the kind that's driving the peer, uh, uh, the, 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 the mm -hmm. platform cooperative in question is, how do you get some large-ish number of people, whether within an organization or across a network, to be able to make a living off distributed production models? Christopher. While we're transitioning, I guess I, I, I just um, note, not so much maybe for the market, not from the capitalism <clears throat> question, but from more of a social change question. I'm, I just wonder about taking the model and applying it to things like the race dialogue that's started in Boston or, you know, some of the work that's in New York. A shift from, from learning to you know, working on something. Yeah. And, and just what, I mean, even what we can learn from the platform and how it's growing and then apply it to that. Good morning, everyone. Morning. morning. Um, so I'm sitting here uh, wondering how I got here to okay. some degree, and it was it had involved a meeting with Yohai. And who put us together, Yohai, in the first place? Do you remember? I think it was uh, Steve Dawson. Steve yeah. Dawson. Okay, good. Who, well, that's therefore, uh, which is to say, the source of all of that is Mary. Wonderful. And that's so. You so want to blame anyone? Steve blame Mary, but you really you should blame me. Well, that's that's actually. <laughs> That's very if good. If you want to credit anyone, credit Mary. If you want very to blame good. anyone, blame me. Oh, I was going to flip it. Good. Well, this that actually has something to do with, I'll get around to this case behind me uh, in a minute, which Steve was very much involved in. And I was involved in. Um, so um, I think, trying to figure out how I can be useful to you good people here, my, my sort of view of the field and this work uh, is as a practitioner who's been advising companies in doing this, and it's it's a it's a good deal more bricks and mortar uh, than um, collaborative networks. I mean, I've been actually just advising companies in various ways, um, and there might but there might be some lessons that are of interest to you, and and a couple of uh, quick anecdotes I can tell um, that may be provocative. Let me. Um, start by using a framework from a course I teach in trying to sort of paint the picture, the big picture of what this field is about, where it came from in some sense, and, and, and its, its various kind of component parts. In trying to think about that, I uh, some time ago came up with a sort of a scheme of four verbs, four key verbs of worker ownership. Um, take, start, negotiate, and buy. So, in terms of like you know where do where do these ideas come from? How are they being used? Particularly you know in the current moment, I mean a lot of people have been drawn to this work in recent years, and it's very inspiring and great uh, by the courageous acts of workers in Argentina, in particular around the recuperated factories movement the, uh, that took place actually at the end of the millennium and the beginning of the the next millennium. This one. Um, where workers occupied factories and and people said, oh my goodness, look at this is possible that they could do this and with very little management or maybe some not management at all as bricks and mortar and some of those businesses worked out <laughs> quite well, many of them failed, but there's some sort of a um, footprint there mm -hmm. about what's possible. Um, I would not say that's the most generalizable <laughs> way to build a movement. Um, to think that we're going to take over, but it, that sometimes happens. History sometimes serves that up and you do the best you can. Uh, the second verb of to start is closest to the discussion in here, where people have, uh, for a variety of value reasons, historical reasons, are looking for alternative to the standard capitalist model, the standard extractive model or whatever. And that's a... Um, that's a motivation that's existed for centuries. Uh, these ideas are old. Uh, they arguably 
I, I could take you back to hunter gatherers, but let's just deal with uh, Robert Owen and the Rochdale pioneers who started the cooperatives in the UK uh, that inspired a lot of people and the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain up into the 20th century and, and others. Um, these ideas have been around. People have imagined that it's possible to start companies in some, some kind of a democratic basis. And so they've done it. And they've done it with varying degrees of success, depending upon facts and circumstances, historical facts and circumstances that they've faced. And I'll come back to that. Uh, the third verb is to negotiate. And there I'm talking about a kind of a rare case, but it grabs a lot of headlines when it happens, of collectively bargained, negotiated ownership positions, where unions have taken ownership positions in exchange, usually for contract concessions in very large companies. It happened at United Airlines in the late 1990s, uh, where the employees owned 55% of that very large company and had board seats, and I was involved in that and advising unions and, and the company there and can talk about it. It happened in the steel industry before, um, in the 70s and 80s, arguably a sort of a certain revival of the worker ownership idea in the 20th century came around people trying to help workers and this is a kind of a cousin to the to the recuperated factories movement, but uh, in the 70s and 80s here in the United States, my colleagues and I were helping workers try to buy companies for uh, buy companies that were otherwise closing and trying to figure out what could be done there. Uh, that often happened because unions were in place and could represent the workers, and some kind of plan or alternative plan could be could be generated. There were very interest the most interesting stuff in that third verb I would say that ever happened. Uh, that needs to be brought back happened in the UK um, and happened with the Greater London Enterprise Board and it happened uh, with a guy named Mike Lucas of Lucas Aerospace and it was tied into a, a plan of doing conversions of the defense industry to peacetime purposes. It was just an amazingly far-sighted and inspiring example that didn't get too far off the ground but uh, again the ideas are out there. And then the fourth verb uh, is to buy, and that's, um, that's where I spend most of my time. And that's about conversions of established companies that are up and going, where for one reason or another, usually having to do with the founders having reached retirement age and wanting to cash out, um, there's an opportunity for workers to be able to buy these companies. And the predominant legal structure for, use it, for implementing that is not a cooperative, it's an employee stock ownership plan. It can be done through cooperatives, um, and we could talk about that. Um, and for the record, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a, I prefer cooperatives to employee stock ownership plans for a variety of reasons I can get into. I've written a fair amount about this, but I'm also in the real world and I want to put up real numbers and show how this stuff can scale, and, and that's why I spend most of my time uh, with companies like Harpoon Brewing Company here in Boston, you know, where the employees bought, quote, have bought uh, a, an initial stake and will, are on their way to 100% ownership of that company. So those are, those are like four verbs of how this is done. Take, start, negotiate, and buy. And I think uh, for the purposes of um, this discussion, I should just, you know, try to share some thoughts about the, the start space. And I also want to recognize Maggie Cohn in the room who came in late from Cooperative Fund in New England, who's another um, a pioneer uh, and in this space who knows a lot. And, and I've also been doing a little work with Jason of late since there's interest here in Massachusetts in these ideas. Um, there are some challenges that those of you who want to promote this idea, we've, we've already heard a little bit about them. There's some very particular challenges of how to reward entrepreneurs. Let's put that one out on the table. You know, people who uh, who, who start something um, and who put in a disproportionate amount of labor to make something happen, um, and uh, and perhaps after lots of blood, sweat, and tears, and it may be one person, it may be five people, it may be ten people, they get something going, and along comes the second, third generation of workers who come in as owners and. Um, are coming in at a competitive wage scale, and you know, and those and those founders, entrepreneurs have have got some feelings and some some needs that at least have to be thought about. Of how do you deal with um, how do you deal with that sort of 
process um, in this kind of environment. I have a couple thoughts about that. Another related point to that um, is risk capital. Is that is that any capital that's going to help you get started in the early stages is risk capital that will expect a high interest rate because of the risk involved. There are not that many sources who are friendly to startups uh, in this space. Mm -hmm. There are some. Corporate fund is 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 one of them. Uh, and so Maggie should speak to that. Um, and. Um, and then there's there's a sort of an issue of structure, um, and this this gets a, into a little bit of legal legal distinctions. And I'm not a lawyer; I'm a management consultant, um, social psychologist by training, really. But but the um, <clears throat> I think I would just say that my uh, sort of preferred structure of the, of the ones I've seen around cooperative startups is a two classes of share model. Uh, where a, a shares are membership shares that are, are are owned and governed by the natural persons who are going to work in a company, and B shares are non-voting shares that are investor shares, where people supplied with all the all the appropriate uh, documentation of the risks they're facing are in effect um, lending money to the company because they they don't have pause they don't and I don't think they should have positive voting control uh, if they. If they want that, they can go elsewhere. Um, and uh, the I got two minutes. So the the best example of that right now that um, I know of a little bit is uh, that a favorite company is Democracy Brewing. <laughs> it's uh, in Boston here. It's a startup uh, that's with some people out of the labor movement who are are interested in this model and and are doing a fundraise and and um, I'm helping them out a little bit. Um, let's see, so a couple of other um, things, the, the structural things. So I said two classes of shares. There are um, maybe two more semi-technical points. That um, One of them, the first one comes out of Mondragon, and, and I think it's one of the most important things that Mondragon has taught us. Um, is to be able to separate the membership function of a share from the net worth carrying function of a share. A, a, uh, there is a problem of what are called mule cooperatives that, that literally only last a generation because they can't reproduce. And there's a, tra there's, a sim there's a tragedy that has happened. It happened most recently in the 20th century with the plywood cooperatives in the Northwest, where because, because the membership function of a share was not separated from the net worth function of a share. When the firm did very well, the shares rose in value, made it impossible for new workers to buy in. The co-op was dissolved as a result. How Mondragon solved that and how my colleagues at the Industrial Cooperative Association, where I started in 1977, helped solve that is, is helping design a system of what are called internal capital accounts, individual internal capital accounts, where, uh, it, where 70%, let's say, of the profit should go at the end of the year, and a collective reserve where 30% of the profit should go, um, and where the where the a membership share should be established by some some kind of invention, some kind of analysis. It should be more of a of a sort of a gut check. You know, are people serious about wanting to be able to come in? Is two three months worth of of uh, salary something like that that could be paid out of payroll deduction? And where the price is just a fun is just rising with inflation and is not rising with the performance of the firm, so that that little bit of tech of sort of legal technology is important. Um, a third thing, I guess, is uh, something you might consider of a of a startup losses account to go back to uh, the issue of how do you reward the entrepreneurs and the first generation of people who do this, is that you might keep track of. Uh, for some period of time, three years, I don't, whatever whatever it is, of the early losses of a company, and have that as a debt to the uh, that the company has to pay back to the founders over time. So it's a little bit of a repayment of the blood, sweat, and tears of the of the early years. Um, finally, I've got 30 seconds um, on the ideological side, and this is a, a friendly. Push back to Yohai's um, kickoff about 
this being about social production versus market production. Uh, my interest politically in the frame I prefer in talking about this work is economic democracy. That's what I'm interested in. I think it's not, it's, and, and that, that's not socialism, that's not Marxism, that's economic democracy, and I'm not saying that's what Yohai said, but I do want to specify that I actually don't think that the market is the enemy here. I think it's the employment relationship that we have under capitalism, uh, where, you know, owners own and everybody else works for them. It's a sort of, it's a it's the master servant relationship out of feudalism that is reproduced through capitalism, and it, it's reproduced because of power and and, and accumulated power, um, not necessarily because of the market. I, I think the market is is an okay mechanism to determine whether uh, something's working or not. Um, and and I'm and I'm for the I, the vision of a labor managed market economy regulated by a political state, because even worker owned firms will do bad things. <clears throat> so you want to have a state that can can say no, uh, but you want to have firms that that say yes. So thank you. I mean, okay, uh, there are a lot of raised hands. We have only time for one question. So. Oh, why do you prefer cooperatives to yourselves? Um, well, it's a sort of because I believe that the firm should be a democratic social institution and not a, a piece of property. The, the firm should be a democratic social institution that owns property that has these internal capital accounts I talked about, for example. Um, and one of the challenges of doing the work I do in ESOPs is is what if if, if you're still in that property scheme and you're regulated by the laws that we have to live with with ESOPs, which are, are uh, employee benefit laws and security laws, we're vulnerable to takeovers but by people coming and offering a higher price to the trustee for what a company is worth and where by virtue of the laws we have to at least deliberate and, and respect whether we should cash out the employee ownership because somebody's come along and offered 2x of what we're worth. Um, there are ways of dealing with that somewhat with the B Corporation um, idea as, as a kind of a firewall. And there are other things you can do. But with a, with a, with a cooperative, it's, um, it's a lot harder to take it over. Um, the problem is that, no, no. is that a cooperative is a, is a lot harder to sort of scale up and yeah. sell if, for, if you're trying to capture a major part of the market of privately held businesses that baby boomers are selling out of these days that are at 50 to 500 million dollars in sales. Those are, the, those are like the scaled big companies that I'm interested in, in making a dent in. And I'm interested in our fund, our American Working Capital Fund, being competing with private equity to be able to back employees to be able to buy those firms. That's very hard to do with the cooperative structure. It's not impossible. Thanks a lot. Sure. We have Mayo now from Barcelona. Okay, I'm going to present uh, what we have been doing in uh, Barcelona with the um, Barcelona Collaborative Economy uh, Plan. You have to think about a framework in which the government of the city council um, uh, is mainly uh, a in the context of a party that was started from the Indignados mobilization, that actually is called Barcelona Comun. So it's a citizen's candidature very much inspired by the commons, bringing the commons into the political institution. So this is the framework which is very, very favorable because many, many principles uh, in which we are developing this. Uh, there are two guidelines that inspire what we have been doing. First one is Collaborative politics for a collaborative economy. I will explain further what this means. Uh, second, commons-oriented collaborative economy might be the most, uh, the better model for the city. And we frame it as commons collaborative economy because uh, there is a matter of uh, strategies, as Ben Ben has said, in terms of we are thinking about a strategy that's very focused into entering to market-oriented sustainability models and assuring uh, a generation of income or generation of work. That's a strategy. Another strategy might be assuring access to a, a common resource. There are different. Also, uh, a strategy of funding by uh, uh, public funding or research funds. Like, there are different strategies 
uh, in which um, we can enter to think about, but there is also an element of how you frame it uh, how, in order to, uh, for example, in our case, use windows of political opportunity. In this moment, at the European Commission level, there is the debate about the European agenda of collaborative economy. And for us, it's very good to frame it as collaborative economy because then we are invited into places that we wouldn't be. The commons is considered economy now for DigiGrowth, which for us is like a winning, no? So just distinguishing this element of, of the framing. And, and when, when we are talking in the framework of the network of, of uh, social economy and cooperative economy in Catalonia, we might be talking about open cooperatives or platform cooperatives. No? Um, so also regarding the framework, you have to, uh, so the plan of collaborative economy is being developed by the Commission of Social and Solidarity Economy. So it's in the framework of which um, try to promote uh, alternative modalities of economy. Uh, in Barcelona, from 8 to 10 percent of the GDP are based on cooperatives and, and social economy. So it's not something, it's, it's, 10 percent is not 30 percent like in Bologna, but it's not a minor part. And so we are thinking how far different um, trajectories of socioeconomical innovation might help us to scale this from the 10 percent to a 30 percent after two mandates. Let's hope this. Um, but we, we are recognizing also like the uh, uh, caring economy, the green economy, like others in this ecosystem of different sources of uh, transformation. Uh, a, 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 a research done by Manuel Castells actually uh, show how far in the context of Barcelona after the 2008 crisis there has been a, an increase of alternative economic modalities, no? in many, not only this. So what we have been doing specifically, like going directly to points of things of, of specific actions that we have been doing. Uh, so specific actions to support commons collaborative economy. Uh, we have given a lot of importance to increase awareness because there is a lack of awareness of the model. That's a, a, when you ask the questions also uh, tell you this. So we have been organizing meetings, also facilitating the connection between the uh, digital commons movement with the cooperativist movement, also going to more of a startup kind of modalities of uh, uh, festivals, also support them for contaminate and, 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 and make arrive this type of more commons oriented modality to start that type of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we have been also trying to shift of the approach of uh, very big events happening in Barcelona, like the Smart City Congress, the worldwide larger Congress of, of Smart City Technology, or the Mobile World Congress. Those are organized by the City Council, so we actually have a position to reshape the agenda, but we are doing it not in a uh, disruptive manner, but kind of in a, a progressive and um, kind of building constructive manner to actually deal with, uh, with the, these spaces. Second, funding. Uh, uh, the lack of uh, uh, funding is a, a very, very uh, problem in the sector. So in this, we have pro we are providing a program of match funding, which means that a project gets um, uh, the funding for, from the city council depending on what has raised in a crowdfunding uh, pro uh, campaign. So second, we have the we have a project, uh, European project for experimenting basic income that we are going to be experimenting to neighborhood, along also the introduction of a local currency, and we are seeing how these two elements might uh, may see the growth or might benefit the Commons Collaborative Economy. We don't know that it's going to happen, but let's see. We are also, as part of the urban development expansion, we are promoting a set of uh, like fab, uh, fab, fab and, and, uh, and makers spaces in different neighborhoods to distribute it to the city. Uh, we have formation entrepreneurs programs and, uh, and the program of La Comunificadora, which we supported 15 new initiatives. It was not difficult to find them. We have much more demand that we could uh, actually respond. And we are building a, a specific incubator building for uh, this type of economy. But last, uh, we see Commons Collaborative Economy as a possibility of, of, of an alternative to privatization. So uh, we are revising the ways in which there is the public procurement being happening in order to allow that actually this kind of economy can go into the goals of public procurement, which currently it doesn't because how it's done, it, 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 it penalized. 
and also making pilots to see how to make collaborative public services, incorporating, for example, within it, this uh, wireless community uh, network into the system, but it's really, really difficult because regul regulation is the main uh, uh, glass ceiling of the commons collaborative economy. So, uh, like, really mm, not allowing many of the things that we would, do. we would be doing. We have also a recycling um, um, infrastructure, uh, unutilized infrastructure for putting in collaborative use, like um, computers. Uh, regarding the how, so it's not only how what you do, but how you do it. In this terms, um, we have moved from a policy perspective. We have moved from a top-down, expert-based consultancy framework to building an ecosystem for the policy co-creation for many reasons. Uh, I, I'm not going to explain it, but, but also for being effective. Not it's not a, on a, a matter of being participative, but for effectiveness, because many of the skills are outside and the creativity is outside. So we have been building relationships with stakeholders and also partnership with research. In terms of a relationship with the stakeholders, I will not go into detail, but we have like four layers of participation from a platform, digital platform where participating to a meetup, that's a monthly meetup and an annual a public policy forum event that uh, Jorge will come <coughs> in the next one, in which we develop this kind of co-creation methodologies. And we have a Barcola, which is a working group between the city council and 25 representatives of the Commons Collaborative Economy in the city. The last layer is a inter in transversal group inside of the city council for uh, allow uh, internal coordination. Uh, we also, very, very important, we have been um, a relationship and a partnership with research because many this model is unknown, has not been very much research, and there are many solutions that need really co-design. Co so uh, in this terms, um, there is the partnership with my research group. We also uh, uh, have guidelines from the Vermont and uh, there are four projects that are providing funding. But it's not only a matter of funding and bringing like millions of euros for doing this, but also it's a matter of building a framework in which you can experiment because inside of the city council there are many things you cannot do. You cannot like uh, 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 organize things in, in that doesn't follow the stru uh, hierarchical structure. So these projects allow you to do pilots, experimentation, and so also sometimes even um, skip the regulation limitations. Um, uh, very important, we have been through the research uh, uh, specifying what actually differentiates the Commons Collaborative Economy in regard to the unicorn. No, I will not explain in detail to this audience, but mainly is the type of economical enterprise, more democratic and, and very top down of the unicorn, the type of technology being based on free software and the type of data. Uh, and this is very, very important to us. And we are building a tool for actually allowing what we call it the commons balance. Like a balance of how commons oriented is a, a, an initiative, also a, a unicorn modality of initiative. Because this is very important for us because when we implement the policies and we want to support the commons collaborative economy in the entrepreneurs uh, program, for example, we need clear criteria for distinguishing the models. And so we are building this uh, as, a, as a indicators connected to five of the dimensions that for us it, it represent the common balance re regarding the, the type of uh, economical uh, model, financial model or sustainability model, the social responsibility, how far they have inclusive policies and, and environmental impact, the technological policy, the knowledge policy and the governance. Uh, we have uh, um, mapped the collaborative economy in the city. We have identified 1,000 cases. Ha you have to say to have present that half of the cases, 50% of the cases, are not platforms. Are things that provide support to the platform. So they they develop technologies. There are spaces. They they provide uh, uh, educational training, and that's something very characteristic of the model that uh, it needs a lot of ecosystem elements in order to the platform's cases actually work. The other element uh, <coughs> is that any, uh, perhaps two or three, but most of the cases don't fulfill our commons balance criteria. And like you don't expect that the cases are going to be in everything, but might be good at some parts of the start and not at the others. Uh, uh, just three models of, of, of other thing is don't think about Commons Collaborative Economy as a uniform uh, model, but more like uh, inside uh, areas, 
or modalities. This is one, one uh, and also salts, you know? This is one salt that is what we call, we are uh, cooperatives that are, all of them are uh, cooperatives that are named we are energy, we are communication, we are mobility. So these ones provide collaborative consumption of, of um, ecological cars and, and, and motorcycles. This one's about collaborative consumption and production of energy, which is being integrated into the energy policy of the city council. This is about communication policy. So all of them regard to different sectors and, and changes the model of production and consumption. And all of them are naming we are because uh, it's, it's connected to the idea of economic sovereignty in a context of a large political sovereignty uh, framework of Catalonia. The, the other one is uh, freelance mutualization corps, Smart B with 19,000 people in Belgium. These are freelance getting together through a platform in order to mutualize their services and support each other. And the last one is um, a spin off corps, a spin off uh, from institutions. So, a spin offs from universities are frequent, a spin offs from city council or from administration, or what we call not spin offs from, from big corps but actually uh, what we call a, pl a platformization of big corporations. Big corporations like, like Abacus that have one million members, that they start to think about how to bring their services into platform modality in order to survive. Fine, fine. Uh, I just, to finish, to invite you to the Procomus event in, in June, and then in November in the Smart City Congress, and an encounter we will be doing about cooperative innovation with uh, other cities. We have time for a very quick question. Much better. Thanks a lot. How much recruiting do you do in the sectors where you don't have a presence yet? That was one of my questions, whether there was a concentration of, of these um, uh, opportunities coming up in a specific sector. It sounds like you have different sectors where you see this kind of organization. But do you... Um, go out and try and recruit to develop uh, offerings within sectors that aren't represented already to build out this ecosystem? Or do you wait to see what comes up? So the element that we have Bacola, this working group that is city council and 25 representatives that is keep growing, um, it's a way of, of getting to know very well the sector. So it's not that what is there? What do we do? No, it's actually you have a very, very important representation of it thinking with you. Mm -hmm. And so identifying opportunities, identifying necessities for a consolidated case to actually get internationalized. We have get local cases to get internationalized with international um, uh, relationship. So I think that's, that's really useful, I would say. Not only like participative, but very useful in terms of uh, making things. Okay. Right. I'll be quick since I'm last and everybody wants to get coffee. Uh, so my name is Jason E. Wansing and I work at the mayor's office uh, for the city of Boston. And my main project has been working on the city's worker cooperative initiative or what would be more accurately called the uh, initiative to support employee ownership and worker co-ops in the city of Boston. Um, I started about 10 months ago and the National League of Cities Equitable Economic Development Fellowship started 10 months ago. So the city of Boston is one of six cities across the country um, that are working with the National League of Cities to develop an initiative to promote equitable economic development. And uh, we st before I came onto the city, they started with the premise that Boston is one of the most un economically unequal cities in the United States. Um, by some measures, it is the most unequal. Um, and, and we decided um, for a variety of reasons that um, exploring ways to promote employee ownership and the development of worker cooperatives would be an interesting and fruitful way to go with the initiative. Ah. Continue. Uh, so I'll start with um, this quote from Mayor Walsh at the 2017 State of the City Address. He's talking about small business, but the sense is we built Boston's first citywide system of small business support as a small business plan. Uh, and we're encouraging worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, he also recently, I have to thank two people in the room, spoke at events just in the last couple of weeks, the mayor. One was at the um, Dorchester Food Co-op, Maggie was there. Um, he talked about um, how cooperatives can uh, promote equality, and he talked about um, the city at large. And then last week, he gave a speech at Harpoon Brewery, 
at their Harpoon Fest uh, to 250 employees about the potential of employee ownership to reduce uh, inequality. I thank Chris for making that connection to Dan Canary. Um, so he has, he has more and more been talking about this. He actually just last week published an article in the Boston Business Journal um, in support of employee ownership. They talk mostly about ESOPs in the article. Um, so the mayor's talking about it. It's become um, one of the, the key initiatives in the Office of Economic Development. Uh, so the fellows are, are Joyce Linehan, who's the Chief of Policy, a uh, very important person in the city and my boss. Uh, Trin Lin, the Director of the Office of Workforce Development, who does great work, uh, especially with the unions in the city. If you know building pathways uh, and, and operation exit, they pay are at risk um, or formerly uh, imprison young people with, with unions, with the trades. Um, they have like a 90% success rate. It, it's, it's really a great program. And then John Smith, who works in the Office of Economic Development. Uh, and then I have come in. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an honorary fellow, um, and I've helped, helped lead the work. Um, so I talked about this. this. This work, we're kind of seeing this at the nexus of the mayor's efforts to reduce economic inequality and uh, increase upward economic mobility and to support small businesses. Um, so we've, we've, the city um, might be able to announce soon um, an economic mobility lab, but in the very case that the mayor has made that more and more of a priority. Um, and then the small business plan, supporting small businesses, that's been uh, key for him as well. So we've kind of aimed to put this work in that context. So I focused mostly on the Office of Small Business Development in the city, because they have existing resources that we could uh, build in to support um, work cooperatives. Um, this is all, I'll, I'll skip this. It's, a, it's an interesting crowd because usually I have to go through a definition of what a worker cooperative and employee ownership are, but I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip through that. Um, so so the, the initiative so far has, has focused on incorporating co-op specific and employee ownership specific programming and assistance in the pre-existing city programs. So the Office of Small Business does on-site technical assistance. We will pay for that. It has some loan programs that target low-income and minority communities. Uh, so we were just thinking of ways to incorporate support for cooperative businesses uh, into those existing structures. Um, we've assembled practitioners like Chris and Maggie uh, and a bunch of others in the area uh, and convened discussions around the different challenges that co-ops and employee-owned companies face in the area. Um, um, so a few months ago, the city announced that it hired two uh, employee ownership and co-op ownership focused technical assistance providers in its on-site TA program. So previously, if a worker co-op or an aspiring worker co-op or an employee-owned firm had an issue that was specific to that model, they really had nowhere to go in the city now. Um, we're already in talks with a few. Uh, they come to the city, work with the small business team. If we have the resources and the time and the expertise, and in most cases now we will, uh, we'll kind of pair them with the on-site TA provider and the city pays for that service. So especially for smaller startup firms like Rochester Food Co-op, um, that could be a big deal. Um, it, it can also be used for businesses interested in converting to employee ownership, whether to a worker co-op or to an ESOP. Uh, we actually hope to have a meeting with a business owner next week about kickstarting that process. So um, we're already seeing some movement in that direction. Um, so to use Chris's framework, we're focusing on starting and buying. Not so much. The city's not going to take over businesses. Uh, at this point. Why not? <laughs> uh, oh. Maybe we'll Give get there. Um, we're also doing a co-op workshop series. Um, kind of a few to kick off. I think I think you sent out the email um, earlier this week. Um, th this has changed. So we're doing kind of two general ones for the general public, for business support organizations, for anybody interested in cooperative and employee ownership. Um, also hope to plug in some of some worker co-ops in the city to the technical assistance at this event so they'll know about these structures um, but they could learn some things that get plugged into the PA so we're having one next Wednesday um, at on May 30 May 31st 10 a.m. to noon at the bowling building the Roxbury Innovation Center um, we'll have some some of the Main Streets directors throughout the city but the Main Streets program um, we also have some um, CDC folks, Community Development Corporation folks there. And um, 
come and fight and fight other people. Um, Eventbrite should be up soon for that. And there's one June 22nd, too. And that one we're targeting more towards business owners. One because there's a lot more time. We have four weeks. Um, and, and, and yeah, so basically for that reason. Uh, also, the city is, should be announcing fairly soon the opening of the Small Business Center, which is a one-stop shop for any business owner to come and say, I, you know, even if the city doesn't have resources to fix their particular problem, they can, uh, the city can point them in the right direction. Um, within that, um, depending on how much support and uh, energy is around the employee ownership stuff, we could have something like an employee ownership division, which would likely be one person who could serve that function for any business interested in converting to or starting as a worker co-op or an employee owned company. Yes. Um, procurement, also we mentioned procurement. Um, early this year we had the first worker co-op, we believe, um, certified as a, as a, a business with a small um, I think that small woman-owned business in the city of Boston, that's uh, Lord Holmes from Cerro, um, the commercial composting company. Uh, we hope to get some more uh, registered with the city. And because procurement's a big, messy thing, uh, you know, we haven't had any, any grand solutions to that, but we were committed to continue to working on um, ways to incorporate employee-owned and worker-owned companies uh, in the city's contracting. Uh, and and that that could there's there's one idea that's kind of that's this kind of this huge grand strategy and there are other smaller ones we can do within that even if it's just making sure that on the listserv that I have of employee owned companies they get the information for the workshops because they haven't been included in many of those um, that's a wide range and then the press so the mayor speaking at these events is a big deal uh, and, and for those who don't know Boston's a strong mayor system. Um, so the mayor has a lot of power. Um, the city council, um, the city council um, has a lot of power as well. But but my and so I've been told by the Sustainable Economies Law Center and others who specialize in this space that what Boston is doing is unique and that it's coming out of a mayor's office. And many in many other cities, folks are kind of going the activist route through city council, trying to pass different ordinances, like in Oakland. Um, that has happened here as well, um, but this is in, in um, concert with the, the local efforts and the experts in the field. This is coming out of the mayor's office and embedding in existing programs. Um, it's also been uh, cooperative, as I mentioned, in the uh, Imagine Boston 2030 draft document, which is coming out uh, next month, the final version. Um, and we'll have, we'll have an employee ownership week at some point. <laughs> And we're also thinking about workforce development. This is very. This is also very early stages. Um, the lowest lift for this is making sure that um, worker co-ops and employee-owned companies have access to existing grants and programs in OWD, um, because there's you know many of them would, would get these grants based on their qualifications. Uh, it's just a matter of connecting them. And the other thing is about is using um, the model of a worker cooperative or trying to think creatively about how to use that to. Um, promote upward economic mobility to um, help with re-entry for um, for uh, formerly incarcerated young people and so on. Uh, we'll also have some form of advisory council. Uh, uh, to be frank, this has been slowed down a little bit, but I think I'll make it a more informal working group, and then um, we'll eventually move towards a more formal advisory council that will um, study a bunch of issues because. I mean, essentially, the legwork on this project has just been me and a few hours a week of my colleagues who are very, very busy people. Um, so there are a bunch of other issues that I don't know or don't have the time to look into, and we could use the experts in the field to dig into a bunch of, whether it's permitting, uh, more procurement, more detailed procurement stuff, et cetera. So a group of smart people, no employee ownership to delve into these issues. So. We are super late, but like one very brief question and very brief answer, please. Uh, very brief question. Um, so the city, this is amazing work. Uh, the city does a number of initiatives to support uh, startups in the tech space. There's like you know, incubator programs and so on and so forth. Is there any possibility to, or is that something you've talked about connecting with those so that uh, cooperatives and other forms of worker ownership are on the table um, in that startup tech sector space? In addition to all the amazing work you've done, which seems to be we're in the brick and mortar, small and medium sized uh, firms. So we're, we're, I think we're moving more in that direction. I see that brief email. So there's one 
Um, one idea someone's floated is there's a loan fund in the city. I haven't looked at the details. I just got the two-page memo. But it was um, it, this $400,000 loan fund in the city that's dedicated for tech startups. Uh, and this person proposed some model where you would, at the very least, alert the the people in the startup of this model, mm -hmm. or at most, and I don't know the legal issues or the political issues around this, but at most you would sort of for, I don't want to say force, but in effect force them to become, if by giving them a loan, um, some form of employee-owned company. I don't know what that looks like or if there's a way to structure incentives so you don't have to force anybody to do anything. They choose this voluntarily. Um, but in short, like we're beginning to think through some of those issues in the tech space, uh, and, and I, I welcome any input.